In Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 30, Jesus is going to make a very important statement. But this statement is one that is very direct. It's one that is very thought-provoking. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not scattereth abroad. Now when we think about Jesus saying, He who's not with me is against me, He's basically letting us know you're either on my side or you're not on my side. And when we think about the two sides, we're either on God's side or we are either on Satan's side. There is a song that our young people sing on a regular basis, especially when we go to camp. And the song, the title of it is, Whose Side Are You Living On? And when you sing this particular song, it's asked in the form of a question and the answer is, I'm living on the Lord's side. And you repeat this over and over and over in it. You add other things to the verse, to the stanza of each song. But every single time, the emphasis is, I'm on the Lord's side. And so when we think about sides tonight, and whose side that we are on, are you on God's side or are you on Satan's side? And that question, that passage from Matthew 12 and verse number 30 is going to be a question, is going to be a passage that we're going to interweave throughout our study tonight as we dig in and we do a study about God and Satan. Tonight, for the next few moments, there are two questions that we want to consider about God and Satan. The first one is this, what things do God and Satan have in common? You ever thought about that before? What things do God and Satan have in common? Well, somebody may say they don't have anything in common whatsoever. When we think about God, we think about Satan, that these are rivals that we read about in the Scriptures, and there's no way that they have anything in common. Now, as you think about that statement for just a moment, I want you to think about those of you who are sports fans I want you to think about some of the, the, the greatest college rivalries for just a moment. Think about college football. Well, we've got a rivalry here in our own backyard. It's one between Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Now, if you were to ask a fan from Mississippi State or ask a fan from Ole Miss, what do you have in common with that other school they might be the first to tell you, we've got nothing in common with them whatsoever. Don't put us on the same line. Don't use us in the same paragraph. If you're an Ole Miss fan, I've got nothing in common with Mississippi State. If you're a Mississippi State fan, I've got nothing in common with Ole Miss. Well, let's think about that for just a few moments. Number one, both of you are in the same state. Both of you are in, and I'm a little bit biased here, but both of you play in the greatest conference in, in the entire country. Both of you are in the greatest division in the entire country. You recruit the same players. You see those similarities that are there? And you could extend that to a little bit broader category. You could talk about Alabama and Auburn and, and the rivalry that they have. You could go up north and you could talk about Michigan and the Ohio State rivalry. If you think about basketball, you could think about Duke and North Carolina. And, and, but here's the thing. As bitter rivalries as these schools are, they have a number of things in common. When we think about God and Satan, there are actually several things that they have in common. I want to give you five things that they've got in common this evening. Here's the first thing. Both are in the soul-winning business. Both are in the soul-winning business. Notice that we didn't put soul-saving business there. We're calling it the soul-winning business. Jesus is interested in our soul. We know that from Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10, the Son of Man is coming to seek and to save those who are lost. You look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21, as the information is being shared with Joseph and Mary that you're going to be having a son, you're going to call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is interested in winning souls. 
But did you know that Satan is interested in souls as well? He's interested in your soul and he is interested in my soul. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and let's look at number, verse number 8 for just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. It's that familiar passage that Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Why do we need to do this? Because your adversary, your opponent, your rival, the devil, has a roaring lion walking, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want you to focus in on that word devour for just a moment. That's a word that carries with it the idea to gulp down. It's a word that resembles the thought of to utterly destroy. When, when you think about a lion, if you've ever watched the animal planet before, you ever watch lions and, and how they go after their prey? They're not just trying to wound their prey, are they? When they go after a zebra or maybe a hyena or whatever other kind of animal that's out there, do they just try to injure it? And then once they injure it, they leave and, and go on about their merry way? What, what's a lion end up doing? He's going to injure it, but that lion is going to pick that animal clean down to the very bone, right? Maybe Peter was picturing here when he wrote this. Maybe he was picturing the Roman Colosseum. And various scholars and historians have said that in the Colosseum you'd have spectators that were sitting in there and they were cheering on the action that was taking place. And sometimes the action was you would have lions that would eat Christians, you would have lions that would eat criminals. And when that lion got a hold of a human being, it was going to gulp that individual down. And so when we think about the devil, and Peter's description that he's giving here, he says he wants to gulp you down. He wants to utterly devour and destroy your soul. Now what is their strategies? When you think about the strategy of God, Number one, God is going to use the gospel. If you look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 7, Paul will write these words. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What, what's he talking about when he talks about a treasure? He's talking about a, this book that we hold in our hands. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about a message of hope, a message of good news. When you look at Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel, preach the good news to every living creature. When we look at our Bibles and when we think about the gospel, do we think about a treasure that we have and a treasure that, that we're supposed to be taking to other people? because we're supposed to be in the soul-winning business as well. But how does the devil, how does he operate? How, how does, does Satan, what, what does he do to go about his strategy in winning souls? I want to invite your attention over to John chapter 8, verse number 44. And just like with Matthew 12, 30, this is also going to be a passage that we're going to interweave a few different times looking at a couple of different words and a couple of different phrases but if you look at John 8, verse number 44, and you look down towards the end of this text, of course the whole entire passage is talking about and making references to the devil. He says, for he is a liar. What's his strategy? God's strategy is the gospel, but Satan's strategy is deception. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and there he is, he's having that conversation with Eve. All he adds is one word. God says, you shall surely die if you eat of this particular fruit. The devil says, you shall not surely die. You see the deception that was there? Now go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and let's look at verse number 14. And I want you to notice how Paul describes him here. He says, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's going to disguise himself. He's all about darkness, but he's going to disguise himself into being light. You see the deception that's there? Now, if you go back in that context to verse number 3, where's he going to take our attention back to? 
He's going to take us back all the way to the garden to Genesis chapter 3 and he's going to make a reference there to Eve. And so when we think about God, when we think about Satan, both are in the soul winning business. But here's the second thing to remember about what God and Satan have in common. Both of them have churches. Did you know that? That both God and Satan have churches? When we look at Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28, reminded there about the words of Luke, he's going to be giving some responsibilities to the elders from the congregation of Ephesus. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. Now what are they going to do? To feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And so there he's talking about the church which God has, but the reference here, of course, is to the Lord. His son was the one who purchased it with his blood. When you look at Romans 16 and verse number 16, Paul said the churches of Christ salute you. When you look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18, Jesus said upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, one that's going to belong to him. He's got ownership over it. And then when you look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And what church was he adding them to? Of course, we know that he's adding them to the one and only church that was in existence at that particular time. It's the one that belongs to our Lord. Now let's think about Satan for just a moment. Do you know that Satan's got a church as well? Satanic temple is what it's referred to at times. It was actually started in 1969 by an individual by the name of Anton LaVey. And this is the symbol that, that they have as far as their particular uh, religious group is concerned. They are able to enjoy the tax-exempt status from the IRS. They are recognized as a full-fledged denomination in our country. But let me mention this to you. Did you. Do you know that you don't have to be a member of the Satanic Temple? Do you know that you don't have to be a member of the church at Sa of Satan to be on the devil's side? Did you know that you don't have to do that? All Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse number 30, he said, he that's not with me is against me. You're either on God's side or you're on the devil's side. And a person doesn't have to be a, a part of the Satanic church in order to be against the Lord. But number three, both of them have Bibles. Both of them have Bibles. When you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16, Paul said all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? All of God's Word is inspired. All of God's Word is God-breathed. And it's got a benefit to it. When you look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3, he's given us all things that pertain to what? To life. Everything that we need for physical life, but also everything that we need for spiritual life and godliness. He's given us all things that we need to be like him. Now where has he given all of that information? To know about physical life, to know about spiritual life, to know how to be like him. It's in this book right here. When we think about the church of Satan, there's a satanic Bible that has been <clears throat> published. And once again, it was published by the one who started the satanic temple, Anton LaVey. And here's just a picture of what, uh, what it looks like. Once again, there's their symbol that they have branded there on that particular book. That particular book has sold... Uh, around one million copies since the late 1960s. And, and basically anything that you read about in the scriptures as far as morality is concerned, it, guess what the Satanic Bible is going to do? It's going to talk about the exact opposite. Anything in regard to serving the God of heaven it's going to talk about the exact opposite in this book. So one, one thing that God says, when you look at the Satanic Bible, you're going to go to the opposite side with both of these. But did you know that an individual doesn't have to read the Satanic Bible to be on the devil's side? They don't have to do that. 
Because what did Jesus say? He that's not with me is against me. And so when we think about Satan, when we think about God, both are in the soul winning business. Both of them have churches. Both of them have Bibles. But number four, both have disciples. Both have followers to them. If you look at John chapter 13 and verse number 35, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Others are going to know that you're followers of mine. It's going to be based upon love. When you go to John chapter 8, verse number 31, Jesus would speak these words. He said to the Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. When you look at John 15 and verse number 8, he said, Herein is my Father glorified. Well, how are we going to glorify God? That you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. You think about being a follower of Jesus, three things are involved. Number one, we're going to be people who love each other. Number two, we're going to be individuals who continue, who abide in the Word of God. That This Word is going to direct our lives. We're going to obey it. But then number three, we're going to be people who bear spiritual fruit in our life. But then on, when we think about Satan, we think about his father. Go back to John chapter 8, verse number 44. When you look at John chapter 8, verse number 44, Jesus said, Ye are of your father, who? The devil. Now who is Jesus speaking to in John chapter 8? He's speaking to religious people. People who thought they were doing right. People who thought that they were being pleasing to God. But what does he tell them? You're not on God's side. You're on the devil's side. You're his children. You think that got their attention? Here they are. They're thinking that they're these great religious elites. And then God says, that's your father right there, the devil. Number five, both have places for their followers. In John chapter 14, when you look at verse number 2, Jesus would speak these words. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus is preparing a place. Jesus, we know, is sitting on the right hand of the throne of God at this time. So he's got a place for his followers. The devil's got a place for his followers too. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25 and let's look at verse number 41. And let's notice here what Jesus has to say. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And so when we think about what God and Satan have in common, there's actually several different things that, that we can see here where they have some similarities. But let's notice the flip side. Let's notice the second question. What are the differences between God and Satan? What are the differences between the two? Here's the first thing to remember. God is interested in truth. And this one really goes along with what we mentioned just a few moments ago when we talked about their strategy. The, the truth is the Word of God, and that's what God is continually interested in. When you look over at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 9, Paul will use these words. He says, lie not to one another. Don't lie. Well, why does he tell us not to do that? Because lying is a part of who? It's a part of the old man. It's a part of that individual who has it put on cross. But when you look at Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2, since you've obeyed the gospel, since you are now in Christ, you're going to seek those things which are above. You're going to do those things that are going to be pleasing to God. When you look over at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 16, six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. When you look at those seven things that God finds detestable, did you know that two of those relate to the tongue and both of them relate to the subject of lying? The first one that he mentions is a lying tongue and then another one is, is a false witness. But both of those, when you boil it down, is all about lying, isn't it? 
It's something that God hates. Something that he cannot stand and something that's not to be a part of those who are his children. And so when we think about God, he is interested in the truth. But on the other hand, what's Satan interested in? He's interested in lies. When you go back there to John chapter 8, verse number 44, what did Jesus say? He tells us at the very end, he is a liar. Now notice this next part. And the father of us. What does that word father mean in that context? It's a word that means the source. He's the source of lies. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. If you're not going to be people who are about telling the truth, what's he saying? Whose side are we on? We're on the devil's side. Let's make sure that we're not people who are on the devil's side. Number two, here's a second major difference between them. God is almighty and infinite. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 17, and let's look at verse number one. Genesis 17 and verse number one. The Bible tells us, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, that is, he's 99, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. In the Hebrew there, when you see that phrase, the Almighty God, it's the word El Shaddai. And that phrase there, El Shaddai, is a description of His awesome power. When we think about God and His power, He has an infinite amount of power. Can you think of the power that God would use all throughout the Old Testament? This was a question that we asked to some of our young people this morning in Bible class. Where do we see God's power throughout the Old Testament Scriptures? And guess what? They listed about eight or ten different things that immediately came to their mind. The first time that we ever see His powers in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. In the beginning, God, what did He do? What's that next word? Created the heavens and the earth. That is, he created something from nothing. Has anybody else ever been able to do something like that? To create something from nothing. That right there lays the foundation. The very first verse of the scriptures highlights the great almighty power, the infinite power of God. But did you know that when we think about the power of Satan, that his powers are limited? Let's go back to the book of Job for just a moment. And let's see the limits that are going to be placed on his power. Job chapter 1 and verse number 12. And before you get there to verse number 12, you'll remember that, that Job was a very blessed man, wasn't he? He's a very wealthy man. And what did the accuser have to say about Job? The only reason why... He is following you. The only reason why he's following you, God, is because of the way that you've blessed him. You take care of, take all of these things from him, he'll follow you no more. All right, let's notice what God tells Satan. Verse number 12, he says, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth not thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So his first instruction is you can do anything that you want to him, just don't touch him. Keep your hands off of him. But then look at Job chapter 2. And let's notice how things progress. Job 2 and verse number 6, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. He's at your disposal. The only thing that you can't do is take his life. Now, when we think about the power of Satan, who was the one that gave him his powers to begin with? God did. And God was the one who placed limits around the power that he had. But here's a third thing to consider. God promises life. He promises life. Let's turn to John chapter 3. Let's look at verse number 36, and let's notice how he promises life. When you look at John 3, verse number 36, and we're going to notice this from the American Standard here tonight. He says, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life. That, that phrase, eternal life, is found 11 times 
11 times in the gospel account of John. Now, when he talks about eternal life, oftentimes he's going to put some parameters on how an individual can have eternal life. Notice how he continues to go on. He says, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life. So if we want the promise of life, what do we have to do? We've got to obey the one who gives life. But then let's flip the coin. But Satan, what's he promise? He promises death. When you look at Revelation chapter 21, and you look at verse number 8, here we are in the midst of a study about the subject of heaven. And then he says, I want you to know about the ones who were barred from entering into heaven. And notice who he talks about. He says, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their parts in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Who is there in that place? It's prepared for the devil, right? The devil, he's the one that provides death. He's not going to provide life for us. Here's the fourth thing to consider. God requires control. He requires control. If you look at 1 Corinthians 9 and verse number 27, I want you to notice the words of the Apostle Paul here. He says, but I keep under my body. The New King James there translates it this way, I discipline my body. That's the idea of having self-control. Why was Paul going to have self-control and bring it into subjection? That is, I'm going to subject myself to Jesus. I'm going to submit myself. I'm going to be a slave to him. Lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul says, I preach this message where I go around and I preach to other people that they need to discipline themselves and they need to submit to Jesus. Well, why would I live any other way? And he says, if I live inconsistently from the message that I'm preaching, he says, I'm going to be a castaway. I'm going to be one who is disqualified. And Paul didn't want to be disqualified spiritually. He didn't want to be put out of the race. But you know what? On the flip side, God wants us to be in control, but Satan wants us to lose all restraint. I want to invite your attention over to Matthew chapter 4 for just a moment. When you look at Matthew 4 verses 1 through 11, do you remember what's going on there? Jesus is fasting. He's been out there in the wilderness. He's fasting. The devil comes on the scene and he begins to tempt our Lord. First thing that he mentions to him in verse number 3, turn these stones into bread. You think Jesus was hungry? You ever gone days without food? Most of us can't go several hours without food. But think about going several days without food and how even something like a stone and knowing you've got the power to turn it into bread. Jesus, I want you to break your fast and I want you to turn these stones into bread. In essence, he's telling him, just go ahead and lose control. Don't discipline yourself anymore. Now, if, if you've ever been on a a, a diet that requires a lot of fasting or, or a diet that requires you to lay off of this food or make sure you eat a lot of, of that particular food there, is there a lot of discipline that goes along with that? You have to train yourself, don't you? Spiritually, Paul is training himself. He says, I can't lose all restraints that I've got. And so the devil, he's trying to get Jesus to lose his restraints. If you look at verse number 6 and you look at verse number 9, Hey, Jesus, why don't you throw yourself down off of the temple? It, it is said by various scholars that the backside of the temple, that Jerusalem, it sat on one of the, the, the highest places, and so there was, there was a major valley that was down below. And if a person were to jump off of this, no doubt, they would be severely injured, and it would probably be instant death for most people. Jesus, go ahead and throw yourself down off the temple. When you throw yourself down, save yourself. And I guarantee you if you do that, everybody will bow down and they will follow you. Verse number 9. 
Won't you worship me? Don't worry about worshiping the Father anymore. Just worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms in the world. You see what he's trying to convince him to do? Don't stay under control. Lose your restraint. Does that happen to us sometimes today? We give in to sin. We don't discipline ourselves, and we lose control. Say things we shouldn't do, do things that we shouldn't do, because the devil's gotten the best of us. We've given in to temptation. You see, God wants us to stay under control. The devil wants us to lose all of our restraints. Number five, God requires obedience and work. Two passages very quickly tonight. When you look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10, Jesus would talk about being faithful unto death so that we can receive a crown of life. When you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you look at Ephesians 2 and verse number 10, he talked about how we're his craftsmanship, that, that we are people to be about good works. You see, Christianity, God says, my people, those that are on my side, it's about faithfulness. It's about obedience. It's about work. But on the flip side, but one can be a follower of Satan by doing nothing. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. Do you know that you don't have to do anything and you can be on the devil's side because you're not going to be on God's side? Here's our final thing to consider tonight. God is the God of heaven. He's the God of heaven. When you look at Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse number 5, I want you to notice the description that's given about him. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. The newer translations will translate it there, the great and awesome God. But where is he? He's the God of heaven. That's a phrase that is seen periodically over and over again in the Old Testament, talking about and designating where God is. But I want to close out tonight by looking at Satan, because Satan is the God of this world. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4, Paul, once again, writing about the devil, he says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I want you to pay attention to what he's writing here. He says, The God of this world is blinded people. The devil's the God of this world. He's not the God of heaven. What's going to happen to this world one day? According to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10, this world is going to be destroyed. But here's what happens a lot of times. We can't seem to get the world out of us. We can't seem to transform ourselves from being pulled in to the world. When you look at Isaiah 5 and verse number 20, there were those that looked at evil and the Bible says that it was good to them. But then they looked at good and good was evil. There are some times today that there are some Christians who will laugh at godliness when we should be embracing it. But we're so influenced by this world and keeping our foot, one foot in the world to a place that's going to be destroyed one day. I want us to think back to that question that we started with. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you living on? When you think about your life just over the last seven days, the last week, whose side have you been living on? God's side, or have you been living on Satan's side? Have you been living after the God of heaven? You've been on his side, or you've been living after the God of this world? What about in the last month? You've been striving to live for the God of heaven, staying on his side? 
or you've been living for the God of this world. As we close out with that question, whose side are you on? If you've never been obedient to the gospel of Christ, you're not on God's side right now. But you can change that tonight by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, 24. By repenting of sin, Acts 17, verse number 30. By making the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And by being baptized into Christ so that we can have our sins washed away, Acts 22, verse number 16. But the Bible doesn't stop there. God's Word tells us to live faithful unto death, Revelation 2 and verse number 10. To stay on the Lord's side. It's not just something that happens one time and then for the rest of our life we're automatically on His side. No, it's going to take some obedience to stay on His side. And it'll be well worth it in the end. And so the question for you tonight is whose side are you on? If you're a child of God this evening and you realize that you haven't been living on the Lord's side, you can come forward tonight through repentance and prayer you can leave here tonight on his side once again. If you're subject to heaven's invitation, whether it's in obedience to the gospel or coming back to the fold, won't you come forward as together we stand and as we sing.